And we're very fortunate to have four experts uh, on these countries, uh, and I'll introduce them briefly. Their bios are in your uh, booklets. Uh, from uh, uh, Egypt, we have a friend and colleague, Dr. Amr al-Shubaki, immediately to my left. Uh, Dr. Shubaki is a former member of the Egyptian parliament uh, after the revolution as an independent. He was also head of the governance committee in the uh, committee that drafted the new constitution, so very much involved uh, in that uh, process. Uh, he's an academic, uh, he's author of a number of books and reports. Uh, he runs a think tank in Egypt called the Arab Forum for Alternatives, and he is also today uh, Secretary General of one of the uh, coalitions that are preparing for the parliamentary elections, uh, the Wefid coalition, coalition he might tell us more about that. Uh, to his left is uh, Bill Lawrence. Uh, Bill uh, very kindly stepped in for our uh, colleague, Dr. Lerbi Sadiki, who wasn't able to make his flight and make it uh, to Washington. Uh, Larbi is, uh, is Tunisian and uh, is an academic that's written a lot about it. Uh, Bill also is an expert on North Africa and Tunisia, and he very kindly uh, uh, accepted to step in and uh, fill us in on developments uh, in Tunisia. Bill is a visiting professor at the George Washington University's Elliott School. He's also an adjunct, adjunct scholar at the Washington Institute for Near East Policy. And for the past two years, he was also the director of the North Africa Project at the International Crisis Group. He's lived in North Africa for many years, has written a number of uh, uh, books and reports on the issue, and we're very happy to have him. To his left is uh, Charles Schmitz. Uh, Charles is a fellow at the Middle East Institute. He's also a professor at Towson University in Baltimore. Uh, he's one of the rare experts uh, in, in, uh, in and around town on the complex dynamics in Yemen. He's written a lot uh, on the Yemeni uh, situation for the Middle East Institute, for other institutions, uh, and we're very, very happy to have him with us today. And to his left uh, is my uh, friend and former colleague, Fred Wary, who is currently with the Carnegie, uh, Carnegie Endowment for International Peace. He's a senior associate there. Uh, before joining Carnegie, he was at the Rand Institute, and he was a senior policy analyst there. Uh, Fred focuses on uh, Gulf political and security affairs, but also uh, focuses on Libya and has been there uh, several times in, in the recent past. Uh, he is also uh, has a, a career, a uh, 19-year veteran of the active and reserve components of the U.S. Air Force, and has served in tours in Iraq, Turkey, Libya, Uganda, Algeria, and Oman. He has many publications on Libya and other issues, but on Libya most recently, uh, publications from the Carnegie Endowment, such as Ending Libya's Civil War, Building Libya's Security Sector. Uh, he's also the author of a, a very well-received book on sectarian politics in the Gulf. Uh, and uh, we're very happy to have Fred with us. Uh, let me start with a very open question. Three years ago, we were talking about transition. There was an assumption that the massive uprisings uh, that overtook these four countries and other countries at, as well led to the downfall of uh, rulers in most of these countries, that these were part of some historic process uh, which we called loosely transition. We compared it to other events in Europe and Latin America, and obviously there was an expectation, certainly a hope, that this would lead to some kind of democratic transition. Uh, there's no doubt that the results so far are a mixed bag, and that is without even mentioning the disastrous situation in Syria. Let me start, Charles, uh, with you, if I may. And uh, my question is, since in, in Yemen the developments may be over this particular past year and the last few months of what happened in Yemen have really changed uh, uh, the, what people perceive from the outside from a transition that certainly had a lot of problems and wasn't necessarily a fantastic success but was still inching forward with national dialogue and uh, power sharing and things of that nature to a situation that evolved in the last two, three months which appears very, very different. How would you... What words, what, what narrative, what dynamic do you think 
is taking place in Yemen? Do you still see it as a, as a transition of sorts? What's left of the original hopes? Do I need to press it? I think they're on. You just have they're to on. be okay. close to the microphone. Right. Um, I, would, I would say that uh, transition is a, is a good word, but of course it has many different meanings. Uh, and that uh, in Yemen we, had a, we have still uh, a transitional government uh, which was to oversee uh, um, the transition from Ali Dalla Salak's regime to a new, more supposedly uh, democratic regime. Um, but actually I, I would like to shift the focus a little bit in, in terms of what the meaning of the transition is because I think it's very important in the Yemeni context to understand that um, Yemen is going through very rapid social change and that the social change is affecting the dynamics of politics in Yemen. I think it's something that's important to focus on. Uh, Yemen, Yemeni society is often... Bring it even closer. It's a bit faint. Yemeni society is often characterized as uh, uh, very tribal, and um, the understanding of tribes and the relationship to the state have been uh, at the heart of a lot of people's attempts to understand Yemeni politics. Um, and I, th I think that uh, Yemeni politics, because of the very rapid um, demographic change within uh, the lifetime of a single Yemeni, the population has gone from 6 million to 24 million, um, that um, the, the organization of society has changed and uh, uh, politics, the basis of politics have changed. So more specifically on that, um, what I see in this particular period, the transitional period, is that uh, rather than kind of um, uh, military high tribal uh, networks of, of patronage organizing politics, I see now uh, politics being organized by political parties. Um, that the competitions between the different uh, political parties uh, there have been, have, has been the center of the contests in the transitional period and political parties themselves are reaching out into rural areas. So you'll find, uh, you know, local tribes that are being patronized not by, um, you know, a, a particular person but by a, a party. Um, and I think the organization of society by political parties rather than um, what had been before uh, is an important ex aspect of, of Yemeni politics uh, that, that I think it's important to understand the, the changes that are happening in, in Yemeni society and that they uh, play a big role in uh, you know, what the outcome of, of Yemeni's transition will be. Well, let me press you on a, a bit on that. A lot of people are saying with what the Houthi movement has done recently mm -hmm. is leading to a complete breakdown, break up, perhaps, you know, the Hirak in the south, the Al-Qaeda sort of responding from, from their regions. Do you see what's happening, and do Yemenis, or Yemenis you're in touch with, see this as a, a break, break up and break down, or is it using force to influence the political process? Many people compare it a bit to Lebanon, Hezbollah in Lebanon and so on, mm. but Hezbollah also is also part of a political process, formation mm. of government and so on. So politics does evolve as well. Do you see it as impacting a transition and power sharing in a government uh, or breakup the, of the national project? The, the Houth, yes, the, the, how the Houthis are going to play this is, uh, is, is a question that everybody's asking. Um, they, when the Houthis took over, when they took Sana'a, they immediately signed uh, what, was, what was deemed uh, a peace treaty with the government uh, in which all sides agreed to, re they re-agreed to implement the outcomes of the national dialogue, which are all quite uh, progressive and, and equitable and everybody's happy with, the, with it on paper at least. Um, and the, but the Houthi, of course, have a restricted geographic um, uh, realm of legitimacy. They're trying to expand and trying to become national representatives in the further south areas. But um, they're, they're having difficulty doing that. Um, and so they know that they need a, a, a national government. And so they have got. They, 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 they supported the, the technocratic government that was put into power um, just a few this last week. Um, and uh, they, they seem to be playing a role of kind of uh, overseeing the government. They formed committees that go into the different ministries and sort of oversee their work and, and monitor them and whatnot. And so, um, you know, on the one hand, people say, oh, well, this is, you know, just uh, this is government by the barrel of the gun. They're going to they're gonna have a government in front of them that's not of the Houthi, but that it will be doing Houthi's biddings. Others say that... Um, 
the Houthi actually may bring stability and may bring, in fact, uh, oversight and more financial res responsibility, et cetera, et cetera. Um, the, the, uh, the judgment is still out on you know, how that's going to play. Okay, thanks, Charles. Let me turn to you, Bill, on, on Tunisia. Obviously, Tunisia, especially after the Constitution, the elections and next Sunday or Monday, is it, the presidential Sunday. election, Sunday, uh, that this is the success story. And obviously, in many, in many ways, it is. It avoided a major breakdown. It has passed the consensual constitutions, had peaceful transfer of power. But yet, when I was last in Tunisia just a few months ago, you know, everybody I talked to was, you know, very frustrated, very upset. The secularists are upset that they didn't get rid of the Islamists. The Islamists feel that, you know, they didn't get their fair, you know, day and, or that Islamists are waiting for another opportunity to come back and the secularists are afraid both of the mainstream Islamists and of the radicals around them. That a sense of, yeah, this is good and we're happy with the achievement, but not much sense of, you know, that it's consolidated and how they're going to move forward, let alone dealing with the many socioeconomic issues. In other words, the obvious successes of the Tunisian revolution and the transition, where do you see the, I guess, the, the, the challenges, the pitfalls, and w what is the sort of the challenges in the next, uh, next period once they have a president and a government to consolidate all of this? Well, thank you for adding me at the last minute. I was very Thanks much for accepting, looking, Bill. very much looking forward to hearing Larbi, and we had booked him for the next day to speak, mm -hmm. and uh, uh, I would, we'll try to bring him for all of you to see. Um, I, I should also um, add that I uh, uh, would be remiss not to mention uh, my current affiliations. I do still have a relationship with Winnet, but I, I teach at the uh, at Elliott and also at the uh, University of Stirling's uh, London Academy of Diplomacy. Um, and I am also president of the American Tunisian Association and uh, uh, MENA director at CSID. Um, but I'm speaking on behalf of none of them today. I'm going to give you my own uh, perspectives. I think that the simplest way to look at the uh, Tunisia uh, transition is to step back and think about the Tunisian revolution. And I think the simplest way to explain this is that in many ways there were two revolutions in Tunisia. There was a more rural, more angry, more male, more working class, less socially networked um, uh, protests that began near the Algerian border and deployed a lot of the um, uh, political culture of long-standing unrest in Algeria. Um, and then there was a more urban, more middle and upper class, more both gender, uh, more civil society uh, uh, oriented, more photogenic, more social media linked, <laughs> Uh, revolution um, that picked up and without which the revolution wouldn't have succeeded. And in many ways, the first revolution has failed or hasn't, hasn't reached its objectives and the second revolution is uh, succeeded and now we have a bit of a soft restoration going on of some kind because uh, 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 there, there are different narratives of what just happened. Um, uh, there were also severe economic failures, which I'm happy to expound on a little bit further. Um, but Tunisia was both the most performing, most diverse economy in MENA, and at the same time really failed its population in ways that no one really noticed. And the World Bank has sort of done a mea culpa lately about how they, they misread what was going wrong with the Tunisian economy. Um, and so in this uh, 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 moment of uh, transition, I think there are two important narratives. One is Tunisia has succeeded against all odds. And those who say that Tunisia was always going to succeed because of strong institutions or homogeneity or 10 other arguments are wrong. Tunisia went through a deep political crisis from August to December of 2013 and the whole thing almost derailed. Mm -hmm. um, uh, and, 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 and so the sort of triumphalist discourse that emerged after January of 2014 saying, you know, Tunisia was always going to be better, I think is wrong. I think Tunisia succeeded uh, not just because civil society played a big role, not just because women saved the day, uh, uh, but because political leaders, leaders of political parties, made the deals that needed to be made to keep the, the, the transition on track. You know, deals that are similar to those that need to be made in the countries that aren't having a successful mm -hmm. so, a transition. So uh, while I feel there isn't a Tunisia model, per se, there, there is a Tunisian example which says inclusive politics 
um, uh, uh, secular is willing to negotiate with Islamists, and Islamists on the moderate side are willing to negotiate with seculars, can move countries in the region forward politically in ways that when you buy into the polarized discourse, um, uh, things can, can crash and burn pretty quickly as we're mm -hmm. seeing in some of the other mm -hmm. countries. Uh, okay, and, and looking forward in the next year or two, would you say that Tunisia has sort of done the heavy lifting and turned the tough corners? I mean, they almost had a breakdown in 2013. Yeah. They pulled back, maybe partly because of what they saw next door in Egypt and Libya and whatnot. Uh, they have this new constitution, and they've had one and now two elections. Is the sense of yourself and others who follow Tunisia that the real political dangers have are sort of behind now? There's the hard work of social economic development, managing, maintaining the system, and so on. Or are there any major risks or challenges that could that could really derail? this precious experiment? Well, in answer to your question, I'll give that second narrative I cut myself off from, mm -hmm. from providing a minute ago, which is the, the one narrative is Tunisia's democratic success is, it was, it, was, it, was, it was a beautiful thing and everyone should learn from it in the region and democracy is possible in the Arab and Muslim world. Uh, but the, but the, 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 the other important narrative is that Tunisia is entering a very, very difficult period. Uh, economically, things are bad and not getting better. Uh, it, they, they have what the, one of the presidential candidates and former World Bank uh, uh, official Nebli calls you know, j the inevitable J-curve after a revolution where the economy gets significantly worse before it gets better. And it's not clear when it's going to turn the corner. The tourism's off. I mean, almost mm -hmm. all the bases of the Tunisian economy, Europe is still more abundant. Tunisia's more wired into the European economy. So, so they have a severe economic issue. Tunisia's the ninth uh, largest recipient of U.S. aid in MENA. It should be second or third, mm -hmm. in my opinion. Uh, uh, so the U.S. hasn't stepped up. Um, and so we have, we're, we're going into a, a, an economic dark tunnel here with a 65% of the population that didn't vote in the last elections and who are very unhappy about the economy. Uh, secondly, it has a security crisis. There were more arrests today. There are attacks going on. There are badly affected by what's going on east of them, badly affected by what's going on south of them, uh, uh, terrorists being caught all the time with connections to the Middle East, uh, uh, a huge number of foreign fighters uh, in Syria and Iraq, uh, 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 hundreds of them coming back. Uh, some of those coming back, uh, uh, in fact, the majority of those coming back are coming back disillusioned because they went to fight jihad in Syria against Assad and they got swept up in sectarian and, and, and other types of fighting and so they, they felt misled. But, the, the, but then there's a smaller portion of the fighters coming back from Syria that would like to continue the jihad in Tunisia. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, 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 and unfortunately, uh, if Nehda is not part of a, um, a national unity government, and I don't think this reason is a reason to make them part of a national unity government, uh, Tunisia looks less Islamic to terrorists and therefore becomes more of a target for these terrorists mm -hmm. coming back from the Middle East. Mm -hmm. Um, uh, and then there's the whole third huge challenge of transitional justice and justice sector reform. The justice sector is overwhelmed. All the claims cutting out of the revolution have not been met. Um, uh, and, and then, and then the, the, the prospect of a clean sweep for Nida Tunis. If Nida Tunis controls the parliament, uh, the government, and the presidency, they can stack the constitutional court with all pro Nida Tunis people. Um, uh, which, which creates uh, uh, not only angst among the Islamists, but angst among uh, uh, other revolution, pro-revolution sectors of Tunisian society that mm -hmm. didn't like the RCD and, and its, its remnants in Nida Tunis, and who will be very concerned about uh, 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 justice sector reform getting even slower. Uh, uh, so those are three of the big challenges mm -hmm. we're, we're looking thanks. at. Thanks, thanks a lot, Bill. Let me turn to uh, my friend Amr and, and Egypt. Uh, Bill talked about a soft restoration in Tunisia. Yeah. <laughs> uh, we have a harder restoration in Egypt, uh, but also a kind of an interesting and odd situation in a sense, as you were, we had coffee yesterday saying, I mean, obviously this is a, a kind of a populist hard restoration. Uh, 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 the president still has a wide popular base, although he is you know, and it's a very strong crackdown, very authoritarian, in many ways, kind of reminds me in, in, in different ways of sort of the populist, illiberal leadership, perhaps that Erdogan is going in towards the direction Putin is going in, that there is a popular base, there is some element of 
I don't call it democracy, but some popular base that has also an impact on the mood, obviously in Egypt, uh, in the media, and in in, uh, in public uh, sort of public space uh, per se. Uh, Egypt also has. You were very much part of the writing of the constitution. Uh, in many ways, it's it's a, an excellent, very liberal in many parts of it, very democratic constitution in many ways, uh, and yet uh, the exercise of power is going in a different direction. Uh, elections are supposed to happen for a parliament which is supposed to turn constitutional articles into law. So there's sort of a contradiction even in the post-Muslim uh, Brotherhood regime, as it were. Um, you have great experience in, in all of these you know, aspects, both participating in them and analyzing them. Uh, how would you describe Egypt's situation now? Is it S stalled? Is it sort of halted in its transition? Has it reversed completely because in many ways there are things worse than some elements than was before? Or is there still a path forward from this very security conscious situation to some regeneration down the road? How do you see it? Okay. And let me say that Amr is uh, obviously Egyptian and French educated, so English is his third language, and uh, uh, so uh, I'm happy that he accepted our invitation. And uh, go ahead, I think the microphone is on. Just okay, speak into it. Um, thanks. Um, I do my best to express myself uh, correctly in English, and uh, I am happy to be in Washington DC for the second time. Uh, I think uh, for uh, the, the, the Egyptian situation, uh, we can talk about uh, uh, the democratic process, it's halted. Uh, it's not failed, but uh, it's halted, and uh, I think uh, we can, uh, uh, trying to, to put some uh, main uh, points to understand uh, exactly the, the, the current situation in Egypt. Uh, Briefly, um, I think in the uh, uh, Arab world, we have three forms uh, talking about the reform, reforming within the system, it's case uh, of Morocco, some Gulf countries, and the second uh, experience, the, the Libya, Libya cases, it's the fall of regime and fall of the state. Uh, it's mean uh, for the Libyan people, uh, they don't fight against the dictator, uh, authoritarian regime, but also fight to establish a national state. The third experience, that's I think it was the case of Tunisia and Egypt, that uh, uh, after uh, the, the two revolutions, the fall of uh, regime uh, uh, necessity to reforming the state. And uh, I think Tunisia, in, uh, in despite the challenges and the problem in the right way, but uh, uh, Egypt uh, has a, a major uh, uh, problems. Why? I think first point, the, uh, the way of the, the, our transition. Uh, after the 25 January, uh, I think in, uh, when we trying to analyze any other uh, countries uh, starting a transition in East Europe, Latin America, I think it's, it's basics. Uh, we have to establish rule of games before uh, to enter to the political uh, competition. I think that's what happened everywhere. Uh, we can uh, make amendment maybe for the uh, constitution. It happened in Poland, by example. They stay seven years and, uh, with the old constitution and after they put it a new one. In Egypt, we, uh, we start uh, political competitions uh, struggle of power without any rules of game and uh, Muslim Brotherhood arrive in uh, power uh, uh, with a president 
uh, and the, the, all, all the people don't know exactly uh, if we are facing a semi-presidential uh, system or presidential system or parliament, parliamentary system. So I think that's completely opposite to what happened in Tunisia. Egypt uh, start uh, a, a democratic process without any rules of game, without constitution, without uh, 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 rule of uh, uh, to, to uh, rule of games, and uh, uh, and for this uh, for this reason, when the uh, uh, the Muslim Brotherhood uh, start to 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 write the, the the first draft of the constitution, I think the majority of the Egyptian uh, people uh, felt that it fits fits for. Uh, only fits for them, only fits to uh, the uh, Muslim Brotherhood. Uh, the second point, uh, it was the experience of the Muslim uh, Brotherhood in uh, power. Uh, I think it was also opposite to what happened uh, in Tunisia, Morocco, maybe Turkey, that in Egypt, we don't have a political actor, political party to make a compromise, to make a deal. Uh, we have, uh, we had a secret organization called Muslim Brotherhood. They refused to legalize itself uh, uh, and uh, continue to be above the state. Uh, no any Egyptian institution could monitoring uh, the Muslim Brotherhood. Uh, we understand it was uh, uh, under Mubarak regime, it was impossible uh, to legalize themselves because it was not allowed. But they arrive in power and they continue to refuse to legalize the Muslim Brotherhood as a legal uh, uh, association. So I think this duality uh, this uh, between political party, the political party freedom and justice for me it doesn't exist, but we have a secret organization monopolated uh, the, uh, the political sphere uh, in Egypt. I think Tunisia it was, um, it, it was opposite. In Nahda, uh, Rashid al Ghannouchi, he is a, a leader of the Nahda party. He is a political actor. So it's by definition you can make a deal and compromise with the political uh, party or with a political actor. But with a secret organization, with a secret association, uh, with uh, a close ideology, with a close society, I think it was uh, impossible to make this. Uh, okay, and let's, let's look yeah. forward. I mean, that that's all points taken. Where we are now, and you yes. know, how can we move forward? Is mm -hmm. to the the, uh, the the problem that's when the the first experience felt, and uh, uh, the president, uh, the ex president, was hosted, uh, not by the democratic uh, way. So uh, I think. Uh, it's mean that something wrong uh, in our uh, democratic uh, experience or democratic uh, 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 transition. Um, I think uh, for uh, the, the, the current situation, we have two major uh, issues. Uh, for the Egyptians, uh, for a huge part for the Egyptians who support uh, the current uh, president, uh, they, they, sa they said we have national state, that's something very important. Our neighbors in Libya, or what happened in Syria and Iraq, and uh, uh, it's a chaos. So for us, we can accept uh, a national and authoritarian state it's better than non-state uh, or than the chaos. That's uh, a, a huge part for uh, uh, Egyptian people now thinking like that. You have the other, uh, uh, the two other lines. 
other, uh, the, the other lines is they said, yes, it's very good to, to keep our national state, but we have to reform it. It's something important to uh, start our institutional reform because this state, it became old and incompetent and we have to start this uh, radical uh, reform. And for sure we have the third uh, discourse uh, came from uh, the Muslim Brotherhood. They consider uh, what happened in, in Egypt, uh, it's only its military uh, uh, coup, and they, they don't see why huge part for the Egyptian people support this, uh, uh, this way and the, and the current president. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you, Amr. Uh, Fred, uh, I will turn to you. <laughs> uh, I, I visited Libya right after the fall of Gaddafi, and certainly there were militias all over the place, and coming from Lebanon, that didn't disturb me too much, but uh, there was also a lot of sort of consensus, A, hostility to Gaddafi, what happened before, and dreams, you know, of our beloved Libya. A lot of, obviously, there was regional and tribal differences, but there was also a strong Libyan uh, identity and an enormous popular pride in their revolution, which was really a full-scale of course, it had external help, but it went all the way, and they were so proud of it. Um, and here we are today, you know, with, with a very, very difficult situation. Uh, two parts. I mean, what would you point to as the critical elements which sort of made it go wrong? I mean, it's a country with a lot of wealth, not, no sectarian differences, and uh, so on. Why did it go so wrong? And obviously, the second part, there's still, there's still a there there. There is, you know, some, you know, a talk of perhaps another election, a way to perhaps move forward. Is it salvageable, and is there a path forward? Uh, the bikes are on. Just be close yeah, well, to them. Great. Okay. Well, thanks for saving the hardest for the for the last. Um, <laughs> You know, you're absolutely right. I mean, I think when, when we visited back in 2012, it was still very possible to be guardedly optimistic about this country for the reasons you, uh, you mentioned. And then, you know, five visits uh, later, it's, it's just heart-wrenching to see its, its uh, trajectory. Um, I mean, I think the, the, sort of, the, the sort of catalyst for a lot of this was the legacy of Qaddafi, that you're, you're talking, I mean, I'm always asked, is Libya a failing state? I say, well, there's never a state to fail um, to begin with, because this is a country that was marked by uh, a real institutional vacuum. I mean, absolutely no political institutions, especially no secure, formal security sector. It, it was always hollow under Qaddafi, and it evaporated uh, during the revolution, and obviously that was the proliferation of the, of the militias. Um, you had, uh, in 2012, relatively fair and transparent uh, elections in, in the summer. And then after that, you had a, a very dangerous decline in security. And I think I would really pinpoint a couple of, of factors. I mean, I think the, the failure of this elected body, the GNC, uh, it, was, it was immature, it was polarized, it, it, its, its members didn't serve uh, their constituents well. Um, but it really wasn't equipped from the beginning. Um, it fell uh, victim to a very exclusionary mindset, and more importantly, it fell victim to pressure by the militias. I mean, there was a partnership that, that evolved between armed actors and politicians, and that, that occurred somewhere around, I think, early uh, 2013. Uh, the militias began becoming involved in politics, and, and the real turning point was this political isolation law. And, and, when I'm asked, you know, what are Libya's divides? I mean, they're, they're often Islamist versus liberal, Misrata versus Zintan, uh, you know, Eastern uh, sort of uh, triumphalism versus the, the center. I think the real dividing line is between what we can call the revolutionary camp and the, the older cadre. And so it's really a contest for the inclusion of the old guard into the new order and these younger revolutionaries who include Islamists about you know, to what degree are they going to open up the new institutions to the older guard? Um, and the real battle for this was the security sector. I mean, the degree to which militias should be incorporated into the new army, this was a really polarizing fight. Um, and it all sort of crystallized with this political isolation law that many uh, likened to debathification. And this was a, a tremendously polarizing 
issue for many Libyans. Uh, it was passed in the parliament at the force of a gun. And, and from that point onward, you really had um, a spiral. You had the militias using armed force to project their agendas. You had the militias uh, in the east under Jadran seizing the oil fields to demand greater autonomy. Um, and, and so I think from that point on, it, it, it really um, spiraled. The second sort of catalyst I see was an external one, and, and this is obviously up for a lot of debate, but it, it's what I call the Sisi effect. Um, the rise of Sisi in Egypt presented a certain narrative in, that, that echoed for many Libyans. Um, I, was, I was in Libya in the east in November of 2013, and many uh, factions, many tribes, many people, including younger liberals, who were opposed to the Islamists, who were opposed, who had their own sort of problems and, and were looking for a way out, saw the Sisi uh, experience in Libya, in Egypt and said, we could use that here. Um, it, it, this, this almost nostalgia for an authoritarian uh, return, <laughs> this, this uh, adulation of the uniform, this longing for order for the police and the army to come in. So I always say that at that point there was, a, there was a part that was written in the Libyan script for an actor to come in and, and play the part. And that actor, as we know, was, was General Khalifa Heftar, who moved in uh, and gathered a lot of support. Many Libyans that I spoke to don't necessarily agree with the man or his vision, or lack of vision really, but he tapped into a grievance and, and he launched this Operation Dignity in, in May of last year, or this year rather. Um, and from that point on, I think we, we've had the story that we all know. Libya is split into two camps, uh, the Dignity Camp in the east with its own uh, parliament in Tobruk, its own par uh, prime minister, the Dawn Camp in the west in Tripoli with its own prime minister and a, and a very defunct uh, parliament, the General National Congress. So there's two, I think, claims to legitimacy now in, in, in Libya. And we can't just say these are Islamists versus non-Islamists. I mean, it's two, it's very complex, it's about uh, rival towns, it's about patronage networks, it's tribes that have tacked on themselves to Islamists. Uh, it's all very dizzying, and it's, it's complex. Um, I think moving forward, some of the saving graces and, and causes for, for perhaps guarded optimism. The oil wealth is one of the few institutions, the National Oil uh, Company has not, been, been, uh, has not fallen victim to these factions. It's still sort of neutral territory as is the Supreme Court, which recently ruled um, in a very controversial way against the House of Representatives in the East. Um, all of the factions also agree on the Constitutional Gra Drafting Committee. I mean, this is a committee that is moving forward on the drafting of a constitution. So there are these sort of beams of, of potential light that we could perhaps latch onto moving forward. I think the way out is this UN-sponsored effort toward, toward dialogue that the UN is leading. Um, other outside actors, including the United States, have weighed sanctions to apply sanctions on certain militias and militant actors. We've already applied them on, on Ansar al-Sharia. There's also talk of applying them against other militias. Um, and it's also insulating these institutions, the National Oil uh, Corporation, the Central Bank, from, from political pressure. And as you perhaps know from the Lebanon model, I mean, can armed groups really ever come to the table after they're exhausted, after they've reached some sort of formal uh, pact, I mean, a TAF agreement, you know, there has to be some sort of national reconciliation mm -hmm. for, for Libyans to come to the table. And I'll just close with um, another important uh, imperative, and that's for these, these regional actors. I mean, Libya in the past year has really become a, a, a war, a battleground for proxy intervention um, for these regional supporters of the factions to back off. Mm -hmm. It's not helpful for the Egyptians, the Emiratis, the Qataris, the Turks, the Sudanese to, to, to play in this fight. Okay, thanks a lot, Fred. Uh, and let me, I mean, use the mention of external actors. We're here externally, we're in Washington, we're in the US. Uh, looking at this a bit from the outside, a lot of these uh, developments have external, regional, or international aspects to them. Uh, let me start again with Charles, because uh, I, for one, I'm not confused now as to who's backing who uh, in the Yemeni situation, but to say that, A, we like your take on how you read sort of the external uh, positioning. Uh, Yemen is also a country, if it fails even further, uh, it's an enormous population, you know, Syrian refugees have spilled over into its neighborhood. If you have a massive, you know, more problems in Yemen, though you can spill over into Saudi Arabia and other places, it can have a lot of consequences, let alone the international terrorism situation. So let me ask, and you know, sort of a quick two-part question to each. What is sort of the current external 
game of play, as it were. And what should the international community either do nothing, step aside, or obviously in Yemen there's initiatives, in Libya there's initiatives. Uh, what, you know, in a, in a meeting like this, one wants to leave with some, you know, well, this might be something to do or not to do. Uh, let's try to be brief. I know these are complex questions, but yeah. uh, on all four, and then we'll move to questions from the floor. So let me char start with you, Charles. Let me, let me first, uh, I think, differentiate. Um, many, many people uh, use the allegory of, of uh, Hezbollah, and I think that's uh, erroneous. I think that um, uh, Hezbollah began as an armed resistance to Israeli occupation, so it began as a paramilitary organization. Whereas the Houthi began as a religious revival organization, kind of a civil rights organization, and they were eventually m became a, a military organization. Um, and in that sense, um, the, the Houthi have very, very deep roots in Yemeni society. It's not something that sort of came from outside and then had it found itself trying to find roots. No, uh, the, the Houthi are very much a domestic organization. And I think that the Iranians, uh, of course, gave them moral support, but little else for much of their history. That, that may be changing. The Houthi organization has gone through many different transitions. Now it's a, a national leader and uh, you know, involved in leading the state and may change its position. The Iranians certainly have some role, but, but I would, I would uh, the, the Houthi could do quite well without them. In terms of the international uh, constellation, I think because of what I just said, um, the, the United States, uh, Europeans, and particularly the Saudis, the, 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 the big player here is the Saudis. The Saudis don't really consider Yemen to be a foreign country, it's sort of their backyard. Um, the relationship between uh, Yemen and Saudi Arabia is the relationship between Mexico and the United States. Um, and so the, the Saudis, um, they, 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 they have been trying to engage in some way the Houthi. I, they, of course, are very distrustful of the Houthi. Um, when the Houthi took uh, Sana'a, the first thing that the Saudis did was try to reach out to them, try to, to get, get appointments with them, and the Houthis declined. They said, uh, we don't have time to talk, respect, we don't, we don't have enough time to respectfully hear the brother's words, and when we do, we'll get back to you. Um, <laughs> but uh, uh, the United States, there were Houthis here in Washington uh, the other day, uh, in spite of their chant of death to America, the, the Americans are, uh, we are engaging the Houthi, which I think is the, way, the thing to do. Um, I, I don't see them as, um, and I don't think anybody really sees them as, as you know, an extension of Iranian foreign policy in Yemen. Um, uh, and I think that's, that's the, the way to go after it. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, Fred, you have an easy case of, uh, well, I mean, obviously in Libya, the international role was key in, in bringing about the result of the removal of Gaddafi and then they sort of pulled back. Now we have a situation, as you indicated, different players in the region backing different parties. There is a UN initiative. Europe is very close. Uh, Egypt has occasionally mentioned that Libya is not exactly its backyard, but it's, it's the most proximate player. Uh, what regional sort of roles do you see and what could be useful beyond what you already mentioned in terms of the UN initiative? Well, I mean, it's not for lack of, you know, planning and will. I mean, when I was there in 2013 and, and I was really struck by the, the amount, the level of commitment that the international community had made um, both multilaterally through NATO, through the EU, which was helping with border control, through, through individual states, in terms of helping the Libyans with their you know, building these institutions, everything from security to, you know, setting up a border guard to uh, advising on, on, you know, a constitution. The problem, I think, is really <clears throat> one of what I hear from diplomats is one of a, a, a partner on the other side. I mean, there's no, there's no interlocutors on the other side. There's no way to inject these funds. I mean, there, and it's also now a problem of pure access because of the security. Um, you know, the U.S., I think, was um, very interested in, in preventing Libya from becoming a failed state and, and was viewing, to some extent, Libya through a counterterrorism lens. And there was a program to train the Libyan security forces, to train the Libyan army. Uh, a number of other states signed up for this initiative. Um, and this speaks to the larger dilemma of, you know, training armies and security forces in fractured political environments, um, as we know from Iraq or Mali. I mean, we don't do very well in these circumstances. And what ha has happened with the initial training effort in Libya is that this initial force that was trained has, has fractured along militia lines. They've gone over to their, or they've been put on leave because there's no real army for them to, to train. So it's been a complete disaster. And, 
in many respects, and the U.S. effort has been put on hold. Um, so again, what I hear is, you know, let, let's get the Libyans in a room. There has to be a broad political compact. They have to decide on the institutions, the chain of command for the, for the military. Um, you know, as, as far as kicking this to the regionals, I mean, there are, there are a number of peace talks being proposed by <clears throat> the Algerians or by the Sudanese. What I hear is that, you know, a lot of these regional partners, they have a dog in the fight. They're not, and they're not always the best, you know, inter, you know mediators for this. So I think the UN is, is the way to go in terms of, of um, mediating in a dialogue. And, you know, these, these airstrikes uh, that have been conducted uh, by the UAE and Egypt, they're, they're allegedly, I mean, they're going after some very bad actors, no doubt. But I think what they're doing is they're inflaming the situation. I mean, they're, they're really pushing a lot of Islamist groups into a corner. Some of the groups that they're attacking are not on the terrorism list. Um, and so this, this regional meddling, I think, is unhelpful on a, on a number of levels. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Fred. Ahmed, let me uh, turn to you. I mean, obviously, there's been shifts in the regional alignments with the Morsi government and obviously with the Sisi government from Qatar, Turkey, at one point to Saudi Arabia, UAE. Uh, uh, the relations with the U.S. have been sort of problematic, certainly. Uh, but Egypt is obviously a giant. Uh, it is not, you know, it is not a minor player. So it's acted upon. Yes, Saudi Arabia and UAE are more wealthy and they can buy influence in that sense. But Egypt also, as an actor, has its own views about its role in the region, about perhaps what's going on in Libya and Syria and so on. So if you could comment on both sort of the external games that are being played in Egypt, how long, you know, how might they play out? How, how long do you think that this relationship with the Gulf, given the enormous economic cost, how do you see that developing? And how do you see, I mean, President Sisi and his following is very nationalistic and harks back to the old Nasser days when Egypt set the agenda on many issues. How do you see that expressing itself, uh, whether it was in Gaza or Libya or Syria or other places? Um, um, it's, um, I think it's, it's true what you uh, said about uh, the nationalist uh, discourse uh, in, uh, in, in Egypt. Um, and uh, um, I think uh, Egypt cannot uh, play uh, an independent uh, or important role without solved uh, uh, big part of uh, our uh, domestic uh, or our uh, internal problems. Um, so I, I think the, the both is uh, uh, related. Uh, for sure, after 25 uh, January, uh, the majority of the Egyptian uh, need uh, new uh, pact with the USA. Uh, the, uh, many people prefer uh, that Egypt could be an independent country, can say uh, yes uh, or no uh, in function is, uh, is uh, interest. Uh, but I, uh, I, I think uh, is, uh, the, the, the problem uh, in Egypt still uh, internal. Um, I mean, uh, to, to play an important role, Egypt needs to be uh, a, a normal uh, country, uh, to go to the uh, normalization uh, between uh, all the political uh, actors uh, accepted uh, who incite who, uh, the violent or, or practice uh, it. Um, uh, I think that's, that, that's the first uh, 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 step uh, for, for the country. Uh, I think what happened uh, uh, last uh, three years, it was uh, the chaos, uh, the, f the felt uh, that uh, we, 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 we hear this discourse very strong now in Egypt, that the Egyptian society uh, or the political actors felt to organize themselves, so we need uh, the strong, strong man, uh, the public order, um, and uh, I think 
uh, it's happened in Libya or could happen in any uh, other countries. Um, to, to, um, we, need, uh, we need to make uh, a reconciliation uh, and also uh, to, to respect uh, the diversity of the Egyptian uh, society. I mean uh, that in Egypt we have a conservative uh, network, uh, we have a, a conservative uh, parties, uh, we have a part of the society don't participate in the revolution, uh, don't like to be all the time in revolutionary uh, discourse, uh, and we have in the same time these progressists or these uh, uh, leftists or these uh, liberal uh, movement. Uh, uh, now we have uh, everyday character assassination. We have, uh, uh, um, so I, I, don't, I don't think that we can play uh, influential uh, role without uh, uh, solve uh, this, all these uh, kinds mm -hmm. of problems mm -hmm. and uh, make a reconciliation between the Pacific and the political actors in the uh, society. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you, Amr. Uh, the last version of that question uh, uh, to you, Bill, but let me say, uh, we'll then turn to questions, so if you want to, those who want to ask questions, uh, there's microphones in the room. Uh, and let me turn to Bill. Uh, uh, perhaps Tunisia had the good fortune of not having had regional alignment so much for and against, yet it is in a rough neighborhood, Libya to one side and authoritarian Algeria to the other. Uh, uh, it has its own, you know, security concerns. It has a long and, and deep economic relationship and maybe even somewhat political with Europe. How do you see sort of Tunisia's, uh, in, you know, placement in its regional international relations, both in terms of things that are still impacting it from the outside and in terms of how its international relations can help move it forward? There's a proverb in, the, in Morocco and some other Middle Eastern countries uh, that says, never marry the neighbor's daughter. <laughs> and I, I was thinking about that when Fred was uh, talking about Libya, because um, there is a problem of neighbors having interests uh, in Libya and neighbors having interests in Tunisia, which is one of the reasons there's such a loud call for help from further afield than the neighborhood. And, and this is a problem for US diplomacy, because we like to regionalize uh, any number of things, and we like to deal with regions because it's easier bureaucratically, and in fact, regions themselves often make things worse, not better. Um, uh, let me also say that um, when Libya and Alger or Algeria sneeze, Tunisia catches a cold. They're, they're, it's a hu small country, hugely affected. I mean, Algeria is 37, 38 million now. Tunisia is 10 and has already turned the demographic transition. It's not growing. So, so it's, a, it's, a, it's, 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 it's hugely impacted by its neighbors for any number of reasons. Um, let me also say that uh, all the countries affecting Libya are either affecting Tunisia in the same way or perceived to be affecting Tunisia in a similar way. So a lot of talk about the Saudi influence, the Emirati influence today in the press, the Qatari influence, the Turkey influence. Only Sudan, really, there isn't a narrative about Sudan meddling in Tunisia, which is significant. I also would say that I think sometimes the Sisi effect can be overstated on the region. It, it wasn't that Sisi set a model that anyone really likes. It's that Sisi um, uh, uh, picked up on uh, uh, political narratives which were already present in the countries. I mean, all of these dictators stayed in power through their anti-Islamist discourse, so Sisi was just the latest manifestation of a discourse which was well impregnated in all these societies, Tunisia, Libya. Um, but I think the bigger story on Sisi was um, the perception that Sisi um, uh, 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 was accepted by the West, and in particular the United States. It was the non-action on Sisi that, that created a lot of confusion in the region because the Arab Spring was all about, oh, the West has finally figured out that democracy moves the region forward. The Sisi coup happens, and then suddenly, oh, the West doesn't care anymore of democracy. Look what's going on in, uh, in Egypt. So, so the perception uh, of, of, of Western indifference to Sisi has had a very negative impact, increasing alienation towards politics in all the countries, in, including Tunisia, and increasing jihadism. Um, 
uh, I, I would also say that Turkey's influence is declining. Erdogan had that victory lap uh, after mm -hmm. the Arab Spring where huge crowds came out without being you know, asked to come out by governments, uh, which is often the case with, with leaders visit town. And, and if Erdogan took the same tour today, uh, he wouldn't get that kind of reception, uh, largely because of uh, 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 people are watching what happened in Turkey domestically, and that had a very negative impact on. Uh, uh, there's also a democratic camp. It's very interesting in Tunisia. The huge number of Scandinavian, you know, NGOs, uh, huge German assistance, even India. India is mm -hmm. part of a democratic camp that's very active in Tunisia, and so there is a, there's, there is a worldwide kind of grassroots effort to support Tunisia, even though there aren't enough resources there. Um, and so that's another piece of this, um, this puzzle. Um, uh, I don't agree with Thomas Friedman when he said Tunisia succeeded because the West didn't mess it up. He had a bed to that effect mm -hmm. last year. Um, uh, 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 Tunisia wants more international help. Uh, and let me just echo what my Egyptian colleagues said about uh, Tunisia's early excess. Daniel Tavana has a great piece in the um, Princeton Review, Monica Marx has one with Brookings, where they lay out in 2011-12 all the things the Tunisians got right in terms of the electoral law, in terms of the constitution. They have tremendous leadership. 20, these 27 presidential candidates, it's now dropped by about a quarter, but uh, uh, the, the voting going on now in the U.S. and, and on Sunday in Tunisia, um, uh, you know, any number of these candidates could be uh, a, a national leader with skills, and I can't think of a Libyan you know, with that skill set. So, so, so we've had a real uh, plus in terms of uh, leadership. I'll, I'll mm -hmm. stop there. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Bill. Okay, uh, we'll turn to questions. Uh, do keep them brief so that we can get as much questions as possible. I'll ask the panelists to note the questions so I can get as, as many as possible. And I'll start with you, sir. Introduce yourself in the My question. My name is Yaya Fanusi. I'm with the United States of Africa 2017 project. I do not have a question, just an observation and it's part of our core values, political values. I hope next year when you're having this conference, you will have women from the respective country on the panelist. Otherwise, you will hear from us. All right, thank you. Question from here. Uh, uh, my name is Mohammed. I'm uh, from New York University. My question are for uh, Dr. Amr Shobaki. So you have said that the transition in Egypt is in hold and it didn't fail yet, but don't you think that the first crackdown on the civil society organization, the protest law, the, 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 the detention of so many, many people now in the prison is, is, is a failure of the, of the transition in Egypt. Second question is about the, the parliamentary election. According to the constitution that you were part of its drafting process, the, the, the parliamentary election should have been held like, you know, within six months, but it, it didn't happen yet. And President Sisi is keep issuing a lot of uh, a lot of laws and a lot of decision without any civilian overseas uh, oversight. Uh, that's, last... Yeah, not three questions each. Oh. There are too many questions. The next uh, person. Thank you. Hi, I'm Stephen Buck, retired Foreign Service officer, former office director for Egypt and North Africa at the State Department. Two quick questions. Sisi, there's lots of support for his repression. That said, isn't his repression going to lead to the very terrorism that he says he's fighting? And second question, cracking down on the border with Gaza, isn't that going to make the conditions in Gaza even worse and therefore facilitate ISIS and other radicals growing because of the conditions that would be much worse by what is being done on the border, okay. cutting off the border? Thank you. Question. Lady here. Hi, thank you. Carissa Gonzalez, I'm with the U.S. State Department. Um, mm -hmm. I actually had a chance to live in Yemen for two years, so this question is for Mr. Schmidt. Um, just a question about the shifting political alliances we tend to see in Yemen. Um, the Houthis used to fight multiple wars against President Saleh and the central government, and now they're sort of overseeing central government and working with Saleh. Um, and also the tribes and how they got kind of pulled into the fray during the revolution in 2011. Um, Given that, what should the U.S. posture be? Um, can the U.S. really do something actively to partner with the Yemeni people and, and navigate this, this complex environment that we have today? And the final piece of that that I'd like to hear your take on is the Southern Separatists movement. Well, how do you assess the Southerners and some of their grievances? And do you see that that is still something that they're looking for in terms of uh, independence from Northern Yemen? Thank you. Thank you. Uh, well, let's take uh, the comments with Ahmed first and then Charles. 
uh, I think uh, it's it's a game. Uh, what you uh, mentioned, it's uh, partially uh, true, uh, but um, uh, I, I think uh, we have political party. Uh, Egyptian civil society uh, use in the uh, uh, university. I, I talk about the, the youth movement who uh, never incite uh, the violent. Uh, fight to establish a, a democratic system in Egypt. Uh, two, uh, three days or four days ago, you, you remember one uh, famous uh, actor in Egypt uh, criticize uh, SCC openly uh, and he said he have he must uh, uh, go away or something like that and we hear a vague uh, of attacks against these uh, actors uh, from many supporters of the president but the result uh, he took the prim, guys, prim of the Cairo uh, vestibule this Khalid Abu Naga and uh, all the Egyptian, uh, the, the Association for the Egyptian Actors uh, uh, published a petition uh, to define uh, these actors. So what, what, what I said, it's, uh, it's uh, like any other uh, country trying to establish a democratic system. For sure, it's not uh, easy. For sure, also, it's not uh, true. It's not. Uh, it's it's true. It's not something uh, invented. Uh, invented in, by a uh, uh, We 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 have a terrorist threaten in Sinai. It's real. Uh, so, uh, under these conditions, uh, I, I I still uh, saying that Egypt has a chance to establish a democratic system. But it's not easy. We had a lot of, prob a lot of problems. Uh, we had a violation for the uh, human rights. We have many problems, that's true. But I think uh, the society and political actors in Egypt uh, not uh, die. Thank you, Amr. Uh, Charles. Uh, thank you for that, uh, those very good questions. I think uh, your first question about uh, the shifting alliances in Yemen is a very important one because people often want to simplify things. And one of the simplifications that we get is sectarianism because the Houthis, of course, are Shia. And uh, so we think, oh, this is the Shia crescent or something like this. But we have to recognize that um, it's really about power, shifting, shifting centers of power. Um, the Saudis, for example, uh, supported uh, these, the, the supported the Shia, supported the royalists in the war in, the, in, in 1962. They were allies, not enemies. It's not a sectarian basis. Um, Ali al Salak first supported the Houthis early on as a counterweight to the Islahis, the Wahhabis that were gaining strength. Uh, then they got into a fight with each other and fought each other, and now they seem to be in alliance again. Um, so what do we what do we uh, what do we get from that? Um, that we have to be very careful about um, putting, say, uh, you know, Islamist, secularist, uh, Shia, Sunni. Uh, these kinds of labels don't help much in sort of clarifying what's going on. But what we want to look at is, you know, how is power being organized in society? Um, and your second question kind of addresses that. What's the relationship of the tribes? I, I think it's dangerous to talk about a thing called the tribes. Um, tribes are uh, going also undergoing rapid social change. The meaning of what a tribe is and how it operates in Yemeni society is uh, very different. There are very different kinds of examples of it uh, that, I could, that I could speak to. Um, and so uh, Yemeni, Yemeni society, the, tribes, the, the tribe is, is very important, but we have to be very careful about what we refer to as a tribe, very specific about what we refer to as, as a tribe. Um, then on the last question, the Southerners, um, the, the Houthi, of course, uh, they do very well in the north. Um, their, their power is that they know Yemeni society very well, um, and they uh, are able to sort of intervene in local politics in such a way as they set themselves up as the mediators, as the, uh, the establishers of justice. And the, the extent to which they can do that um, will be determine how well they're able to establish their rule, particularly in the areas that are further south. Um, and 
the, the Houthi very, very much want the Southerners to come and negotiate with them. They've tried very, very hard to, to get a coherent Southern leadership to come and deal with them. Um, but the Southerners are so incoherent that um, even the Houthi can't get them to respond to what is a golden opportunity for independence. Um, if there's any, there's any time that the Southerners could get independence, it's right now because they're getting international b backing uh, uh, in the Gulf. They're, they're seeing the Southern movement as a, as a, a counter to the Houthi influence in the North. Um, so they've got lots of support, but the, the, uh, the southern leadership is so divided, and there are so many different factions in, Yemeni, in southern Yemeni society um, that haven't been able to sort of come together and create a coherent uh, vision or a coherent uh, political apparatus that could represent the South, but I, I see the southern issue festering and not really going anywhere. Thank you, Charles. Uh, Bill, do you have, Bill or Fred, do you want to add Yeah, something? a couple of quick points. Um, First of all, last year, MEI had women on this panel. We, Ayat Manena from Shebab Libya and uh, a, a woman advisor to Marzuki. So um, I'll say Yeah, I can, I can assure you our yeah. senior vice president, Kate Seeley, <laughs> my boss, Wendy Chamberlain, my colleague, Renda Sleep, who was on the panel earlier, are very... Yeah. Aware uh, of that, and, and so uh, it's not your fault that you're not. Uh, yeah, I'll, I'll say half, half in jest. Let's give men a chance this year, but uh, but um, uh, MEI has done well in that score. But let, let me also say on women, um, uh, the, the the women's issue, uh, as long as it's been raised, uh, cuts both ways in Tunisia. Um, uh, there was a really interesting, during this presidential campaign, the elections happening now, there was a really interesting moment where Labidi from the parliament, who's an Islamist uh, woman. Uh, leader uh, uh, criticized Bejiqai and Sebsi's government's lack policy towards Ansar Sharia, and the person who's about to win these presidential elections responded, Labidi's a woman, only a woman. Um, and and uh, so Labidi responded, yes, I'm a, I'm a woman, but I, I'm, I, I'm for the, fighting for the most democratic and Islamic party that we have in Tunisia, Nehda, and, 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 uh, and Bejiqai and Sebsi came back and said, uh, 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 yes, women saved the revolution, in Tunis, meaning the secular women. But, but we have a real, I think, disconnect, and it doesn't fall well in, into the Western discourse because we always want to see women succeed, but sort of in, the, in, in a secular framework. But uh, most of the women, the huge numbers of women in the Tunisian parliament are Nehdawiyat, and there's, there's a lot in the new crop, too. Um, and so there are two different women's discourses we need to pay attention to. And let me just add one quick other point. The, um, S the Algeria-Egypt comparison is very instructive. Um, I, I, I sat down to write a piece on why Egypt probably wasn't going to become the next Algeria um, and looked up about 10 pieces online and found out they were all arguing that it wasn't going to be on uh, with bad, poor justifications. Not because people didn't understand what was going on in Egypt, but because people didn't understand what happened in Algeria in the 90s. Um, uh, you can find the piece, Is Egypt the Next Algeria? It came out about two weeks after the coup, and it's mostly coming true. But, but, but let me say that um, uh, 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 even though CC is more vulnerable, in my opinion, uh, uh, for the actions he's taking in terms of not being able to control is Islamists for the reasons uh, Stephen Buck pointed out, um, uh, 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 authoritarian leaders like Sisi can hang on for a long time. They hung on in Algeria. You know, so, so this idea that the government's imminently going to fall in Egypt, I think, is an erroneous one. I think the Egyptian military could hang on in an Algerian style for a very long time. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Fred, do you have something you want to add on this? No. Uh, take a question from you, ma'am. Yes, hi. I'm Hala Buck. I'm a foreign service spouse, a Lebanese-American, and a cross-cultural educator. So I'm going to take it a little bit on a transient. Um, we talk a lot about democracy and trying to establish democracy in the Middle East. But I see trying to do that like an organ transplant. You've got to have the recipient and the donor compatible. And uh, I, I would like your opinion because as we talk, I think the panel before talked, every Arab country is different. We're not all uniform monolithic. So how do each of you see this transplant? And I like the word transition instead of revolution because transitions take time. And between point A and B, we're in the no man's land, which, uh, as we all know, takes so long. So I'd like to, uh, and also the lack of trying to understand the culture there in terms of U.S. policy and how that messes things up um, in general. Thanks. From over here. 
Uh, thank you for the intervention. I'm Mune Ben Gerge from Counterpart International, an international implementer, and I'm a proud Tunisian woman too. However, is my question is about Egypt. So, um, Mr. Amr, I was like wondering about where you see the civil society acting in the radical institutional reform. Is there a role for civil society? And do you see like the current, you know, kind of decisions that happen? for several organized, you know, uh, civil society organizational in Egypt will restrain or make civil society step back to, you know, um, to implement or to be, to have a role in the Egyptian transition. Thank you. Thank you, sir. I'm Imad Dean Ahmed from the Minaret of Freedom Institute. My question is for Ambassador Shabaki. Uh, you made the comment that a successful transition in Egypt will require the acceptance of all nonviolent political actors. I agree completely with this, but my question is, how do you see that happening when so many political actors are quick to label the opposition violent? And I don't just mean within Egypt, but in the whole region, like the UAE, which is not only called the Muslim Brotherhood violent, but a number of respected American and British uh, charitable organizations. Thank you. Uh, Ma'am? Hello, my name is Paxton Roberts and I'm a graduate student at the Patterson School of Diplomacy and International Commerce. So you all have been discussing transitioning countries and I was wondering what internal policies you think that these countries will implement to, in order to facilitate further economic growth in the future to try and get them back on, on their development path. Okay, thank you. And the last question? Um, Ilhan Kagri from the Muslim Public Affairs Council. My question is about Egypt also. And um, I was wondering, there's this notion that uh, Egyptian economy is basically twofold. There's a regular economy and there's the economy under the military which runs its own stores, its own housing. So is it possible that the reason you're going to have a lot of support for CC and it's not going to change is because so many people depend on the military for their livelihood and in order to change anything in Egypt, you have to you know, provide a, a way for people to survive economically without having this uh, military uh, support. Thank you. Uh, Fred, let me start with you. There was a question or two of general nature of transplants, sure, sure. transitions, and other issues. <clears throat> the question on the, the transplant of democracy is an interesting one for, for Libya, given its 42-year I mean, history of, of absolutely no participatory governance. You can argue that the 2012 parliamentary elections were premature, that there wasn't sort of the, the structure in place to facilitate you know, the, the growth of democracy. Um, I don't think we can say that it was inadvisable to, to push for this in, in Libya. I mean, when I speak to Libyans, I mean, they talk about, they, they think in terms of democracy and they want to say in government. And you have actual very successful democratic projects at the local level, I mean, municipal councils, elections in, in places like Misrata, Benghazi. So they're thinking in, in these terms. And I think the broader you know, question for, for US policy is one of incremental change and, and not necessarily demanding democracy, but rule of law, transparency, um, reforms on the judiciary sector. I mean, I can't emphasize this enough in a place like Libya, where so much of the, of the resentment of Gaddafi was because of the the nature of the police and the judiciary. I mean, this is really a, the prison system in a lot of these countries is a really catalyzing factor for dissent. Um, I think in Libya, what you're seeing is a reaction to the hyper-centralization of the Qaddafi period. So anything that happens at the national level, be it a project to put in place a national army, be it national elections, is gonna have a real problem with these local centrifugal forces. Um, and this is really the story of, of Libya is, is the emergence of local power centers. So I think moving forward, I mean, US policy has to think in terms of reaching out to the local level and striking a balance between you know, decentralization and, and authority at the national level. As far as the economy, I mean, this is a huge problem in Libya. I think roughly 80% of, of Libyans are employed by the state sector or receive some sort of subsidy. I mean, the, the budget, the state budget has swelled since the collapse of Qaddafi, of the Qaddafi regime. I mean, this is a classic case of the, of the oil curse. The problem in the case of Libya is that many of these rents, many of the state payments are going to the militias. Um, going back to Paul's question earlier, I mean, this was another uh, fateful decision that you can point to by Libya's transitional leadership that I think sent the country 
um, on its spiral was the decision to subsidize and, and pay militias to try to bring them under the state's control to start handing out payments to militias. What did this do? It, it, it mushroomed the militias. I mean, pe Libyans were telling me, you know, people started joining the militias uh, en masse because you wanted to get a salary. So you had young men with no jobs suddenly getting a very nice uh, fat uh, paycheck. And the militias that you see in Libya, I mean, probably two-thirds of them never actually fought in the revolution. They arose after the revolution. So this was a real, I mean, this is a, a problem of leadership. It's a problem of the, the economy. How do you put the genie back in the bottle? But um, no, I mean, economic reform is, is an absolute must, it must in this country, cutting the subsidies, diversifying the, uh, the country. It's, it's a long-term um, challenge that's going to have to proceed in tandem with the, uh, the political reconciliation. Thanks, Fred. Yeah. Charles? Uh, in, in terms of uh, democracy, everybody in Yemen is for democracy. Uh, the, the question is... Uh, can can you get closer to the microphone, Charles? Every, everybody, in, everybody in Yemen is for democracy. Uh, the idea of democracy is, is firmly established in, in Yemeni political values. The question is, who's going to set the stage? Who's going to frame the state in which democracy will take place? And there the political struggles are taking place. Uh, the Houthi, the, Houthi, uh, the Islah, you know, Ali Abdullah Salak, they all agree on kind of the ideological basis of the state in terms of its, you know, institutions and, and, and democracy and whatnot. It's just who's going to control the, then that was the issue in, actually in the, in the overthrow of Ali Abdullah Salak, who's going to control the, the election process? Who's going to control the basis of the state? This, this, this is what's going on in Yemen. So we haven't had, we don't have the political foundation yet for, uh, for elections. We may be building it now, but it's still very much up in the air. Um, in terms of the economy, it's huge in Yemen. It's a huge issue. Um, uh, the Houthi actually exploited the economic situation to take power in the sense that the transitional government was occupied in sort of uh, refining the documents that would be the new uh, basis of the new constitution. When on the street, uh, people felt their fancy talk was irrelevant and uh, the economy was deteriorating rapidly. I think this was a, a big part of the Houthi's ability to take power. Um, the, the situation is very difficult because Yemen is, the oil is, 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 deter is going down, um, oil revenues are shrinking and the, and the economy and state were heavily dependent upon oil. Um, the, the Yemeni economy has to quickly transition to a more diversified economy and one that's much more focused on Yemeni labor, domestic labor, organizing domestic labor uh, to, to increase employment. It's going to be very difficult. Um, it needs an effective state. There are some very nice plans, some very nice, uh, very capable people uh, who uh, are in a position to perhaps do this, but it's going to depend on the political will. Um, the Houthi, when they took power, one of, the, the, their, their, one of their key demands was to get a technocratic group in to oversee the economy. This was a center they know that the economy is a big part of this. Um, and so there's some hope that some uh, coherent plan uh, for the economy could take place, but it's going to depend upon uh, the political battles that are, that are going on very hotly right now to subside so that the state, state policy can begin to have effect. Thank you. Bill? I think organ transplant is the wrong medical metaphor for democracy. I think it's cosmetic surgery. Mm -hmm. um, uh, uh, most uh, political actors in North Africa that I've met uh, complain about democratia shekelia, right? So, so, mm -hmm. uh, the form of democracy without the content of democracy, uh, superficial democracy. Um, I, I said on, uh, on BBC in 2012, uh, and this is the thing I think I've said in public, they got the biggest reaction ever. I said, democracy is learned by doing. And I talked about my own great, 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 great grandfather who was a literate farmer from Massachusetts uh, two centuries ago fighting the British and they didn't have the skills or the education level. Or they weren't going to vote the right way. Uh, and, and they had to learn. And, and, and democracy is a messy process you can't learn in school. You have to learn democracy by doing it. I've, I've interviewed thousands of young people in 12 countries in the region. The, overwhelmingly, they're for democracy. But then they start asking about which democracy. 
So for example, if you're a Tunisian woman activist on the secular side, you care about rights, right? If you're a Tunisian woman political actor on the Islamist side, you're talking about uh, collegiality and Islamic principles and fraternity, you know, you're, it's a different set of values within mm -hmm. democracy. There's a huge debate in Tunisia right now about presidential versus parliamentary system, which masks the more populist parliamentary approach, the Islamist-like, or the, a, a, a strong hand presidential, but this is not questioning democracy. Um, uh, U.S. can't impose democracy, unlike what a lot of my NGO and human rights activist friends seem to think. If you just bash leaders over the head hard enough and shame them publicly enough, the U.S. can force countries to become more democratic. That doesn't, it doesn't happen that way. Uh, but the U.S. can certainly influence, uh, particularly at transitional moments uh, like we're in right now, uh, in ways positive towards democracy. In, in Tunisia, we had 9,000 candidates in the parliamentary elections last night. Uh, last month, three times the number of fighters in Syria. I mean, that was 9,000 Tunisians coming out to run. Incredible number. Um, and let me just say, Islam, uh, the, usually the argument that says this region's not ready for democracy is masking the argument, well, if you hold elections, Islamists win. Well, guess what? Um, they often don't win. And there's great data on this. About half the time, and increasingly in a lot of Muslim countries, the Islamists don't win. They didn't win in Libya. They came in a distant second in the Libyan elections, which helped propel us into the situation we're in now. Um, uh, they came in second in the parliamentary elections in Tunisia. So, you know, let's let people learn democracy. The populations would really like to have it. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Bill. Um. Thank you. <laughs> Uh, um, yes, uh, for the first uh, point uh, concerning the civil society, yes, uh, there are uh, problems uh, now uh, in Egypt, but I, I think also it's very important uh, to know that uh, Egypt compared with the Tunisia experience, in Egypt under Mubarak we had uh, uh, maybe larger uh, space uh, to to, to criticize uh, more uh, than Ben Ali. But uh, the, the problem, if we compare the GTT, uh, the, 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 the Union for the Labour's uh, Tunisian with uh, uh, our uh, Labour's Union in Egypt, in Egypt it was uh, employees for the state. Uh, in, in Tunisia, it was an independent uh, mm -hmm. Labour's union. Uh, sure, make a compromise with the old uh, regime, maybe they didn't have a revolutionary discourse, but that's something else. In, in Tunisia, it was uh, independent. And for this reason, it, uh, they, they play, I'm, for, in my point of view, an important role uh, in all uh, the negotiation uh, between Nahda and the several uh, parties. In Egypt, uh, we don't have this political uh, or syndicate uh, intermediary. Uh, so that's, it was uh, a, a huge uh, problem, uh, and hope uh, we, we can uh, uh, create uh, a real uh, civil uh, society and uh, uh, independent syndicate uh, uh, that's uh, until now it's not uh, the case uh, in Egypt. Uh, uh, so it's more complicated uh, than the current situation. That's what I would like to say. To 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 say that uh, in Tunisia this uh, um, civil uh, society play uh, uh, an important role because it was by definition independent. Uh, uh, and dependent from the state, it's, it was not uh, employees for the state compared with uh, the, 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 the labor uh, in Egypt. Uh, the second point, uh, the second uh, uh, question, uh, yes, for sure, for who, for, for, uh, uh, who uh, we, I, I talk about the political actors. I don't talk about uh, ISIS or any uh, organization uh, protects the violent or incite uh, to the violent to be integrated in the political uh, process. But we, we need 
a political uh, discussion in Egypt, political discussion with the student, a political discussion with the political actors, uh, but uh, if, uh, if our organization uh, uh, incite to the, to, to the violence or protects uh, the terrorists, it's by definition uh, out of the process, of uh, the political process. The third uh, question concerning the, 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 the military, uh, uh, you, you ask uh, that many people uh, working, if I will understand, mm -hmm. uh, if I understood uh, um, uh, if for, for the military and maybe for this reason they support uh, Sisi. Uh, no, I think it's, it's more complicated than, than this uh, issue. Maybe uh, it's, a, it's a factor because in Egypt we have six million people working for the state in the public service it's a huge number if compared with Iran or Turkey, uh, six million working for uh, as a for, for the, uh, the public uh, institution in Egypt. But I think uh, we need to, to understand that it was culture of fear. Uh, 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 what happened after three or four uh, years, it was a partial chaos. Uh, for the Egyptian people, it's something very important to have this central state. We know it's, it's working badly, it's uh, incompetent, but uh, for the majority of the Egyptian, uh, they, 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 were, they supported the Sisi for this reason. Uh, um, it's, uh, it's, uh, we would like to establish the public order uh, to, uh, to define our national state. Uh, we have the terrorists in Sinai, uh, in, in Libya, uh, Sudan divided in two countries, and for the culture, political culture for uh, the Egyptian, the, the integrity, uh, integrity of the state and nation, that's something very important. That's uh, something, uh, it's a country, the, the boards didn't change from five years ago. So it's, it's uh, sacré, it's uh, some, so S I think it's, uh, 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 th that's the real reason uh, for what you said. Paul, Thank would you. you like one minute on the economic question? One minute, go I can, for I it. can do it. Do right. it. Um, the, the, the short answer is we're not going to have good economic policies because of the economic crisis. It's very hard to reform economic. Uh, the, the type of overhaul you need in these transition countries, whether Tunisia, Egypt, uh, be, because of the crisis we're in. And we also didn't diagnose what was wrong with the economy as well. Um, uh, for example, in all the North African countries, over half of the populations and over half of the uh, 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 excuse me, over half of the economies and over half of the population work in the informal sector. And most of these countries still see the informal sector as the enemy as opposed to an engine for, for uh, turning economies forward. Um, so, so until the diagnosis of economic problems becomes more sophisticated, I don't think we're going to see very good economic policies. Thank you, Bill. I, uh, I really learned a lot from, from all the panelists. These are very complex uh, developments, I hope the audience learned as well. Uh, I'm sure they did, and I take hope from the sense I got from all of you that the populations think in terms of transition and going towards democratic institutions, whether they get there soon or later, or the joy is in the process, uh, we shall see. But please join me in thanking our panelists.